We are Mike and Jeannie, and we restore old houses. In 2021, we moved to South Carolina and bought a 120-year-old Victorian house. Follow along as we put the polish back on this Victorian masterpiece. Welcome back to 1834 Restoration House and a Happy New Year to all of you. You're probably wondering why we're sitting in front of this cozy heater here all bundled up. Yes, at the time we're recording this, we're still in this deep freeze that most of this country is in. Yesterday, our temperature was eight degrees. Today, it's 18 degrees. We're in South Carolina, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. Oh. On the first floor of our Victorian house, we have central heat. Thing is, Victorian house of this age is not insulated. So it's not holding the heat very well. And our massive furnace can only hold temperature at 58 degrees. Therefore, these little space heaters are a lifesaver. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we stay in one room and keep it warm. <laughs> right. The upper floor has no heat whatsoever. So the few times we go up there, it's just bone chilling cold up there. Yes. Oh, my. Yeah, now the old houses here, the, uh, particularly this house, was built with coal burning fireplaces. And so you could light fires all over the house and everything would be toasty warm. But we don't have that option today. So here we are. <laughs> In today's video, we were really hoping to paint our window and our window frame that we worked on in the last video. Problem is 58 degrees is way too cold to be painting. Yes. Yeah, that's not going to happen today, especially with oil paint. I'd like to give you a quick update on some of the materials we worked on last week. So we had taken some linseed oil from a hardware store and we mixed it with distilled water, shook it up really good and let it sit. And in the week that it's been sitting here, all of the stuff has fallen out to the bottom. So we have the proteins and we have the uh, fats and the oils have all settled out. The only thing left up here is pure linseed oil. Now we could take this and we could make paint out of it or we could further purify it by running it through that same process again. Instead of concocting our own paint, we went ahead and bought some paint from Sweden. It is made of pure linseed oil, earth pigments, and not a whole lot else. And it's really made for outdoor wood painting. They use it extensively in Northern Europe. And if it works for them, it will certainly work for us. So we'll be using this on our window. In the future, we'd like to practice more paint making and see if we can roll our own. But for now, this is what we use. But not today, because today is too cold and we won't be using this. I'm in the upstairs hallway right now and it is freezing cold, but I wanted to brave the elements to show you something that's really cool. This is a pile of wood uh, from projects that I've collected over the past few years of woodworking. We have all kinds of stuff in here. We've got, we've got finished oak, we've got rough sawn oak. There's a piece of walnut. This is maple, I believe. And we even have a piece of cherry wood. But the one I really wanted to talk about today was down here on the bottom. I've got some beautiful, pristine pieces of eastern white pine that I brought down from New York State. Now, these are eight inches wide and 10 feet long, and I've been saving them for a project that I'd hoped to build eventually. And I think that now is about the right time to do it because we have the tools and we have the time. So I think now is a good time to get started. Those of you who've been with us for a long time will know that restoring a house involves a lot of different skills and woodworking is one of those skills and that's what we're focusing on today. I promise when the weather gets better we'll go outside and do some more interesting things but for now we're hunkered down trying to stay warm. We do have a space heater on here so that's why I'm dressed down just a little bit. So one of the things that I need to learn how to do is to make box joints. Now, a box joint is a time-tested joint where you have a corner of two pieces of wood that come together like this. Now, this is obviously cardboard and it doesn't really fit properly, but it kind of gives you an idea of what a box joint is. So, 
The box joint requires a special jig and you can either make box joints on a table saw with a dado blade, which is an extra fat blade, or you can use the router. Because the dado blades are very expensive, I'm gonna go ahead and use the router because we already have one and I think we can make it work with what we have. Now, looking up different methods of doing this, they all seem to come down to one thing. And this is the time-tested method that woodworkers have been doing for many years and I'm just basically copying what they're doing. So don't give me the credit for this because I didn't invent it. The idea here is that you have a piece of lumber and you wanna cut the slots into it. So you'll put it on here. You'll run the sled back and forth once to cut the hole. You pick it up, put that hole over the index pin and then move it again. And so as you work your way down this thing, you end up cutting a bunch of slots. And then you do that to the opposing board. And the theory being, if you did this properly, is that the two boards will come together and fit in a really nice joint. So in order to do that, we first have to make the sled. This board was scrapped from an earlier project and it had a couple pieces that were just kind of hanging there. So I trimmed those off and made everything square. Now you can see that it's a little bit longer than the actual table itself, which is perfect. So now I need to make some cleats that I can glue on the bottom side here to act as rails so I can slide it back and forth. I'm building this sled out of hardwood oak because it's more durable and it won't move. Now this is a piece of quarter sawn oak. It has all those wonderful medullary rays in it if you catch the light just right. Trouble is it's really too small to do anything with. So I'm gonna go ahead and sacrifice this piece of scrap here and see if I can make it work. It's currently one inch thick. I need to get it down to 5 eighths of an inch thick which is actually 0.625 inches. I have my dial caliper ready to go and we'll go check this out. I was planning on gluing these all together in place on the router table, but unfortunately the way the table saw rails are built, it just doesn't allow that. So what we did is we marked the cleats in the exact positions that they need to be in. So I'm gonna go ahead and glue these up and then we'll clamp it and hope for the best. I'm thinking instead of using bar clamps, we just weigh it down on it. Okay. Are you still in good position there? Yes, everything is perfect over here. Okay, we're good here. Now they're weighed down, everything's in the right position. So we'll go ahead and walk away for 30 minutes and then come back. It's been several hours and here's the sled base. Everything is on there really well. Feels pretty solid. Now, let's see if it fits. It doesn't fit, which means we made it too tight. So I'm going to have to trim off. Oh, let's see here. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch, probably. I shaved a whisker off of this just a little bit to get some clearance back. And now I can put this on and I can slide it back and forth like this, which is perfect. So this is called the sled. Here's the setup so far. We have the sled, and this board here will be the back fence. It's perfectly flat on this edge and this edge. So I'm going to glue it on just like that. I'm going along just to make sure that I have 
full coverage of the glue because if you want a good glue joint, you need to have full coverage and preferably a little bit of squeeze out. We clamp the whole assembly to the table so that it doesn't move. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these clamps on here and this will press the fence down into the sled and help set that glue joint. It's always a good idea to wipe off the excess glue. This is a piece of junk lumber. It was left over from the window making project, but you can see it's got knots, it's got holes, it has cracks, splits, it has bark. Uh, there's another split right there, and look at this. See how bad that is? Well, it's a terrible board, but we can actually clean this up and make use of it. I'm gonna show you how we can take this ratty old board and turn it into something useful. Here's my strategy. You can see how the board is mostly flat here and all of a sudden it curves down like that. Well, that curvature also happens to correspond with that knot. So my strategy is I'm gonna put this on the table saw and I'm going to rip off all of the wood from here over there. You can already see the difference here. It no longer dives downhill like it did since I cut that piece off. It's no longer terrible, but it's not great either. So you can see that there's still some ripples in this and it's kind of wavy, but we can work with this. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is, you see how there's a kind of a cup right here. I'm gonna run this through the jointer and I'm going to flatten out the bottom side of this board. Before I start with this, I'd like to say something. I demonstrated this a few videos ago, and a sharp-eyed viewer contacted me and said that I was doing it wrong, and he was absolutely right. It had been a long time since I'd done it, and so I really I demonstrated this incorrectly. So the correct way to do this is the flat face first, run it through, pull it out, put the flat face against this fence, and then do one edge. In the previous video, I demonstrated that backwards. I did the edge first and then the flat face, but he's absolutely right. The flat face must be done first. Let's take a look here and see how it turned out. So most of this looks really good, but you can see a few areas here where it didn't clean up very well. Uh, these are areas that were depressed. They were more of a valley than a peak. And so we're basically planarizing this 1 16th of an inch at a time. So I need to run this back through the jointer one more time and see if we can't clean that up. Okay, this is good. This is textbook perfect right here. 
It's flat all the way across the board. And yes, we have some flaws in our grain structure here with knots and whatnot, but we really don't care. So now that that part is completely flat, I can take that and put it up against the fence here. And I'm gonna run it through one time or two or three or however many it takes until we get a flat edge. Well, we got lucky that time. We only had to run it through one time to get a flat edge. That is pretty gnarly, or it could be beautiful, depending on what you're trying to achieve. But for us, we just need a fence. We don't need it to look pretty. So I have this edge flat, I have this edge flat, but most importantly, these two are now at 90 degrees to each other, and we can check that with our mechanic square. So we'll just put this on here like that, and there should be no daylight and I don't see any daylight whatsoever. So this is perfect. When you planarize and flatten the face of the board, what you're doing is you're setting yourself up so that you can run that board flat face down through a planer. The jointer will remove wood. Every time you pass wood through it, it's gonna take off a little bit. The planer, on the other hand, will only take off what you set. You can send the board a hundred times through this thing and it won't take off any more wood until you change the adjustment wheel and raise the bed up higher. So the edge, what is that for? The reason we joint the edge flat and straight is so we can run this across the table saw over here. This edge here goes along the fence and this edge here goes along the deck. And that allows you to cut this edge here and cut off the excess and get a nice smooth, flat, parallel surface. Let's work on the planer first. I just wanted to pause for a minute and show you what happened. So it planed off this. This was a high spot. This was also a high spot. And it took material off of here. Everything else was lower than that. So if you imagine the terrain of the earth, you have mountains, you've got valleys. The planer is going to flatten off the mountains. And eventually, if you keep shaving the mountains down, you're going to get to the bottom of the valleys until the earth is completely flat. So let's run this through a few more times and just see how it works. Okay, we now have a perfectly, well, I shouldn't say perfectly, but mostly flat board. And now we have the flat edge up against the fence like we talked about. The flat face is on the deck. So let's go ahead and see if we can clean this edge up. Now, like I said, this is a piece of junk wood. It's got a lot of flaws in it and defects. 
and it's never going to look great. I could probably maybe get maybe a two inch strip of really great wood out of this if I tried hard enough. Well, no, I couldn't do that either because of this knot. So it's basically junk, uh, but it serves our purposes great and it's free. We already have it. So let's go to the next step. We talked about the importance of having all of our corners square. So let's check this. We know that the edge is square. We know that the faces are square, but look at the ends. You see that big gap right there, right here? And we have the same problem on the other end. It's almost guaranteed. And we definitely have a problem there. So what we'll do is put this in the sled. And I'm going to see if I can't just take off, oh, maybe a quarter of an inch. Now our ends are square and looking great. So now this board is perfect as far as being a square and flat. It's been several days since we filmed. The storm did come and the temperatures dropped to eight degrees Fahrenheit, which was actually a minus eight wind chill factor here. It was so cold that nobody was really doing much of anything. The HVAC system in our house couldn't keep it any warmer than 58 degrees. So what we did is we picked a room and we just set up space heaters and hunkered down there for a few days to stay warm. Well, the storm is letting up now and things are getting back to normal and things are warming up. So let's get back to our project here and take the clamps off and see how they look. see how we did here. All right, so we have our sled and we have our backstop or the fence as we call it. And it's looking really good. Here's the jig all glued up. Let's go ahead and put this on and see how it works. Okay, that slides pretty good. Now that we have a good fit on the sled, what I did is I cut a slot there with the router. And the way I did that was just lay it on like that I did a plunge cut in the middle, and then I came all the way back to here. And then I took another piece of wood. This is the, the secondary backstop. I clamped it on, and I ran it through like this to go all the way through it. So now we have a slot here. Also, I took a piece of oak, and I cut it to exactly 3 8 by 3 8 square, and I slip it into the slot and it's a perfect fit. Okay, this is going to become an indexing pin that I can use later on when I'm running real lumber through this thing. But the next thing I need to do is glue this on and make it a permanent part. Let's put the secondary backboard in here. And what I want to do now is by hand, turn the router bit until the blades are facing that way and that way perfectly. Always make sure the thing is unplugged before you stick your hands in there. Now I'm going to take the calibration piece here and set it in. And I want to slide this up until it just touches. There should be a, just a very slight drag right there. And now 
I'm going to go ahead and put a clamp on. The reason I did this is to make sure that this stopper here is exactly 3 eighths of an inch away from this router bit. So now what I'll do is I'll run the bit into the board. This jig is now ready for use. So I'm going to take these two blocks of wood and cut some finger joints into them and show you how this works. Here we have some nice box joint fingers. And let's see how the test cut goes. Well, right away, I can see that the fingers aren't long enough to reach the corner. And that's because the thickness of my wood is thicker than 3 eighths of an inch. So I didn't take that into consideration. Thicker wood means longer fingers. The other problem is when I put it together, I have a bit of an offset here. See how it steps down and steps up here? I'm not sure where that offset came from. If any of you are woodworkers and understand what's going on here, please let me know. So in spite of my best intentions, I don't think this is going to work for us because the router bit's not capable of coming up through here to make a deeper cut. And it'll just barely make 3 eighths of an inch. So that's not going to work. We'll probably have to go to the dado blade method, which is done on the table saw, which is a lot more flexible. And frankly, probably is a lot more accurate. So that's a failure, but we learned a lesson and we'll try something different next time. Well, now that it's warmer, we can actually apply paint to the window frame. So let's open this up. This is the first time I've ever used this product. It's a Swedish oil paint. It's supposed to be kind of a warm white color. You know what that smells like? It smells like artist paint. It smells exactly like artist paint. So there's oil on top and pigment at the bottom, no doubt. I'm gonna use this stirring stick, oddly enough, which came from Sherwin-Williams. There is some really thick pigment down there. Well, this has turned into a beautiful antique white color. And the thing with linseed oil paints is they tend to lean towards the warm end of the spectrum just because they have that, that yellowish kind of orange color in the oil itself. But what happens is that the sun will bleach that out and over time that yellowness will go away. All right, let's see how this oil paint works. My experience with it previously is that a little bit goes a long way. And I'm not get quite getting that level of coverage that I had last time. But I think that this paint is probably thicker than what we used before. But it feels really good. Nice and smooth. And the smell isn't too bad because all it is is really just linseed oil.
Well, this is much different than painting latex. It's very creamy. And the neat thing about this is that there are no chemicals in it. No volatile organic compounds, no solvents, nothing. It's just linseed oil, which comes from the flax plant, and pigments that come from the earth. It's hard to get more wholesome than that. One thing that's really neat about this is that I feel a connection with our ancestors because this is all they had. They didn't have chemical factories, but they did have flax plants, which gave them the seeds with which to make linseed oil. And the pigments come from the earth. So, you know, without getting all environmental on you, you just, I don't know, it's just kind of cool on some levels, but mainly for historical reasons for me. Your dentist is always telling you to brush properly, but the same thing applies to paint. Now you've always been told to paint with the wood grain, right? Well, that's important with latex, but it's critical when you're using oil paint. So we just wanna get that brush in there and it's okay to apply it against the grain as long as you go back and brush it. If you don't follow the grain, your oil paint may dry funny and then everybody will see what you did. So I just like to go back occasionally and just draw the brush back through the wet paint. Now the nice thing about this paint here is that it doesn't dry right away. It really takes days and that gives you a lot of working time. Now that's not to say that you're gonna go back two hours later and try to touch up something you did. You wanna do all your touch up right now. But it's just not as critical as it is with latex paint. So that's something to be aware of. So I'll just come back like that, give it a nice brush, smooth it out. And I've gotta be careful because when I went over the edge, I don't want the paint to leave a ridge there, so I'll just kind of knock that down at the same time. As a woodworker and a restorer of historic houses, I've got to tell you, it pains me to put paint on this beautiful oak. But at the same time, I know that it's oil paint, which is good for it, and it's going outdoors so it really needs the protection. If I don't paint it, then bad things will happen to it.
There is a dark side to oil paint. What happened? We got some on us. I've been able to get mine off. Now it's time for him to get his off. <laughs> we both ended up getting some of it. So what we do, it's really very simple. You just take a paper towel or a cloth, uh, something you can throw away because you're going to have to, and take some turpentine, which is the solvent for oil-based paint, and just very carefully, just kind of, just kind of dab at it. And if you work it, keep working it. It'll usually release the paint from the cloth. The only downside to this is you're going to smell like a pine tree for a while. So maybe you want to change your clothes afterwards <laughs> if you don't like the pine tree smell. But that's how you do it. Luckily, I just brushed it. Actually, I took the paper towels that we used to clean her bibs here <laughs> and uh, took them out to the trash can. And somewhere along the way, I must have brushed against my shirt. Great. Much better. Great. I feel like an air freshener now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I hope you've enjoyed watching some of the joys and pains of woodworking and old house restoration. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. And when you lose, you just dust yourself off, try something different, and eventually you get what you want. Yep. Well, thank you for watching 1834 Restoration House. Like and subscribe, and do leave a comment. We love to read the comments.